So good to have all of you here. We're going to get right into it. Turn with me in your Bibles this morning to Matthew chapter 7 as we conclude the longest teaching series I've ever done here as lead pastor. Uh, We started this back in uh, the beginning of January. Uh, It's been three and a half months as we've been walking through this. But uh, if you're maybe new and just hopping in today, you are joining us like right at the tail end here of a sermon series through uh, Jesus's very famous sermon, the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, We've been taking it verse by verse, line by line, story by story, and today we are going to close it all. Here's how Jesus finishes the sermon. Matthew 7, verse 24. He says, Therefore, anyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rains came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. This is the word of the Lord. This is is how Jesus ends the greatest sermon ever given. He finishes it not with an altar call, not by taking up an offering, and not by calling up the worship team for one closing song. What he does is he finishes it by giving a very stark warning in the form of a parable. So I just want to show you it. A picture is worth a thousand words. Is that the saying? Here we're going to see what Jesus is saying. He says, in closing... It says there was two builders, and they were building their dream homes. And one builder, what he did is he built his house on the rock, and because of this, he was wise. The Greek word there for wise is phronomos. Let me hear you say phronomos. <laughs> Don't you just feel smart? Phronomos. Uh, this word can also be translated smart, intelligent, thoughtful, and it turns out this was a very smart move. Because when the storm came and hit the house, it did not fall because it was firmly rooted on the rock. But then Jesus says there was another builder who built his house on the sand. And this was not phronomos. This was a different word. Jesus says foolish. It's the Greek word moras. Let me hear you say moras. Moras Moras can be translated dumb, stupid. Hopefully there's no kids in the room. In my house, that's like a no-no word, right? Um, Or, quite literally, it's where we get the word moron from. Um, (laughs) Jesus says, well, this decision to build the house on the sand was quite moronic because the same storm that hit that house hit this house, except this house didn't have a foundation. And because they built on the sand, this house just fell with a great crash. This is how Jesus finishes the Sermon on the Mount. And it's this picture that he gives us right at the end that there is a way to live your life that is smart, intelligent, wise, thoughtful. There's phronomos, but there is also a way to live your life that is dumb and stupid and moronic. And you get to choose. So with that in mind today, I've entitled my message, the last message in this series, Don't Be a (laughs) Moros. I was actually going to call my sermon, Don't Be a Moron, but then my staff said, oh, Danny, that's so offensive. So I decided to say it in Greek, okay? It's slightly less offensive. Don't be a (laughs) moros. And before you get angry at me, you need to understand that that this is actually Jesus' big climactic ending. This is, what, this is the big warning, right? Don't be a fool. Suffering is coming. Don't be dumb. Hardship is near. Don't be a moron. The storm is on its way. So what I want to do today is I want to take uh, the end of this kingdom series, and I want to talk about Um, what Jesus talked about at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, and that is storms. 
And it's so important because I am convinced that if we do not get a proper theology of storms, you are just a crisis of faith waiting to happen. Like, if we don't actually talk about this and, and actually figure out, like, how do we plant ourselves on the rock, then all we need is a little bit more wind and a little bit more waves and a little bit more rain to enter in, and our faith crumbles around us. And so today, we're going to talk about storms. There's three things in this tiny little parable at the end of the Sermon on the Mount that I want to teach you. And uh, if you're taking notes, write this down. It's going to be pretty depressing for a little bit, but then we're going to be encouraged at the end. Are you with me? Okay. Here's the first one. Storms hit everybody. Be blessed. (laughs) Storms hit everybody. It's important that we see in this story that the storm hit both homes, the the smart and the foolish, the the, the wise and the dumb. It, it, It hit it, it, it hit the intelligent and it hit the moron, okay? Hits both people equally. It doesn't matter um, what, what, what foundation you're building on. The, the point in the story is that the storm is actually going to come for everybody. Unfortunately, I, like, if you're new to the Christian faith or exploring the Christian faith, Maybe somebody told you, hey, why don't you come to Jesus? Because after you do, it's just rainbows and butterflies. Uh, I love you enough to tell you that is a lie. It is not all rainbows and butterflies um, at all. In fact, the Bible doesn't present that at all. Like at all. I'm going to encourage you today with some of the most depressing Bible verses. Are you ready? (laughs) You're like, no. But here we go. All right. John 16, 33. Jesus says, I have said these things to you that in me, you, watch this word, you may have peace. In the world, you will have tribulation. And just so we're very clear, those are two very different Greek articles. You may and you will. You say, okay, well, which one's the promise of God? Both. Someone here is like, I'm just claiming the promises of God, pastor. Yeah, well, let's claim this. Like, like he, this is a guarantee from Jesus. You may have peace. You will have tribulation. And then I love that line. He does follow it with the same, but take heart because I've overcome the world. Like Parkwood, there is a better day coming. Like, like the kingdom of God is one day is going to be reunited on earth, with God, in the flesh. It's a beautiful day. But unless that day is today, the reality is that we might be walking through some tribulation. I'll give you another one. Ready? Job 14.1. Someone's thinking, oh no, he just went to Job. Yep, I did. Listen, listen to this. (laughs) It says, man who is born of a woman is few of days and full of trouble. Isn't that good? Just slap that on a coffee mug, a bumper sticker, you know, few of days, full of trouble. <laughs> like, it's like a bad slogan for a, like an old country western movie. Like, like I, I say this not to depress anyone, but rather I'm trying to show you what the scriptures actually say. And to be abundantly clear, yes, there's a ton of good in there. There's a ton of positive in there. God loves you. He's got a plan for you. Like his heart posture towards you is good, yes and amen. But it's very important that we understand that until Jesus' kingdom finally comes, we live in a fallen world. And in this fallen world, storms hit everybody. And it is important today when we're talking about storms just to state the obvious, but Jesus is speaking in metaphor here. He's not literally saying, watch out because hail's going to start pouring down on your head. It's, it's like the storm is a metaphor for some big um, disaster, some moment, some conflict, some situation that you find yourself in. That's the storm. Maybe the storm that you're experiencing this morning is a terminal diagnosis from a doctor. Maybe your storm is a financially crippling situation. Maybe 
Your storm is just a cloud of depression and anxiety that just won't lift. Maybe the storm is a broken marriage. Maybe the storm is the sudden loss of a loved one. Storms look different. They come in many different ways, but what you need to see is this. No one is exempt. No one. And if we don't begin to wrap our heads around this, like I said, you are a crisis of faith waiting to happen. If we don't get a good theology of storms, of suffering, of pain in this life, then, then, then you are one bad thing in your life away from just calling it quits with God because somewhere along the line, you began to actually believe that because you do this church thing in this God thing, then maybe the storm shouldn't hit you. I've been pastoring full-time for 16 years, and I have walked with many different people, individuals, families, and I have seen this so many times where all of a sudden they're in the church, serving the church, giving to the church, but they kind of believe the thing that God owes me. And if we, if we honestly believe that God owes you, friend, then what happens the moment that the situation goes south? God's the villain, and we turn our back on him fast. Friend, I want you to hear me. God loves you, loves you, but he owes you nothing. He owes you nothing. When, when we come, there is not this promise that if we give our lives to Jesus, Woo! We get to go around the storm, over the storm, to the right or to the left. No, the way of Jesus is not around or over, but through. That's how Jesus finishes the Sermon on the Mount. He gives us this stark picture just to say storms hit everybody. I'll, I'll, here's point number two. You ready? Point number two. Not just that storms hit everyone. It's also this. Jesus teaches us that storms reveal your foundation. There's nothing like a good storm that'll show you where your feet are planted. I, uh, back in, I, I believe it was early 2018, a uh, personal friend and mentor of mine, Ross Perry, uh, who used to be the associate pastor here, those who remember, uh, passed away. And it went up to Newfoundland for the funeral, and uh, we were leaving and I had this layover. I was flying out of Gander, and I had this layover in St. John's, and then St. John's in Toronto. That flight from Gander to St. John's is like 30 minutes. It's like this little puddle jump. It's, it's tiny. But I remember that morning getting to the Gander airport in blue skies, like no wind. It was a beautiful day. I was ready. Got in the airport, went through security. I'm sitting down, and all of a sudden they called our flight. And it's a tiny little airport, and so you have to go through these sliding doors out on the tarmac to the plane, and there's about 15 of us. They call our flight. All of a sudden, the doors open, and it is literally hailing outside. Like, when I was in there, in just those few moments, a massive storm rolled in. We ran to the plane undercover, got in our seats, and then, the, uh, this is the oddest thing, the pilot comes in, not over a PA, he just walks in the tube part that you fly in, and he looks at us, and I've never experienced this before. He says, all right, I'm not going to lie to you. This is going to be rough. <laughs> top 10 things you never want to hear your pilot say right there. He just looks at us, and he says, listen, this storm is so big, there's literally no way to get above it or around it. We're going through. He so said, the good news is going to be short. Bad news, it's going to be rough. So everyone's like, you know, like those buckles are on tight. We, we took off and it's bumpy, you know, the first like maybe a few minutes or so. And I thought, I got this. This is all good. I got this. And then all of a sudden, something happened that I've never experienced before in my life. To say turbulence is a lie. Okay. I thought we were going to die. I'm not kidding. Like, we, it wasn't bumpy. We were dropping in the air. Like, the plane just, woo, woo, and we're going through this, like, crazy thing. And for, for real, I thought, okay, this is how it ends. This is how it ends. And I knew I wasn't the only one. 
because there's only a few of us in this plane all wrapped in pretty tight. The woman behind me is recommitting her life to Jesus (laughs) out loud. I mean, God, forgive me. Lord, I've sinned. Like she is just going down. The, the, The guy in front of me had this really interesting reaction. He is laughing uncontrollably. Just, if he's gonna go down, he's going down happy. Like he is, he is laughing and laughing. And then the guy to the left of me is just cussing like a sailor. Like words I cannot share from the pulpit of this church. Like, like here's, here's my point. There's nothing like a good storm <laughs> that will reveal your foundation. Even me, I'm on that flight. I'm holding on to my uh, travel bag as tight as I possibly can, and I'm getting right with the Lord. You know, I'm like, okay, God, we've done this before, but Lord, I invite you into my heart just in case you didn't come in the first time. Forgive me of my sins. I'm like, you know, like, you ever been there? Like, storms reveal your foundation. They just do. Both homes looked great on the outside. Both homes, you couldn't tell the difference until the storm came. And it was the storm that actually revealed that the foundation was off. I want you to hear me. When the storms of life come, and they will come, they will shake you to the core. And it's in that moment that it will reveal what your life is built on. It can either be one of the best moments in your life or one of the worst moments in your life. If your life is built on greed and materialism, competition, if it's built on sex or beauty or appearance, if your life is built on popularity and what people think of you, if your life is built on pleasure, the good life, the ability to travel wherever, whenever you want, rather than being built on the rock of Christ, then all that will happen when that storm comes, however it comes, whatever shape it takes, it will expose the sand underneath your feet and your faith will fall in a great crash. Listen to 1 Timothy 5.24. This is Paul saying this to his young apprentice, Timothy. He says, the sins of some are obvious, reaching the place of judgment ahead of them. The sins of others, however, I love this, trail behind them. With some people, you don't see it right away. With with, with some, it just looks, right, like a really good home. It's blue skies, green grass, things are good. It's not until that storm comes that it actually reveals that the foundation was off. Storms hit everybody. Storms reveal your foundation. And now here's the third part, and I'm going to encourage us. I'm going to lift us. You ready to be lifted? Okay. You're like, yes, please. Come on. Here's the third point. Storms cannot destroy a house built on the rock. That's the, that's the picture that Jesus gives us. He doesn't say that the storm will miss the house on the rock. No, to be sure, you're on the rock, you're getting hit. It's coming. That storm will shake you to your core. And at the same time, but the promise is that it just won't break you. He will be enough to actually sustain you through the storm. So here's the big question. The big, big, big question today is how do we know that this is us? How how do we know that our life is actually built on the rock? Or or how do we know for sure that we we don't just have some shifting sand underneath our our feet? Well, Jesus is going to tell us. He's going to be very clear about this. Let's go back into the parable, the very beginning, verse 24. He says, therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine, just pause there for one second. We have to ask, what words? The Sermon on the Mount. 
Everything we've been studying for three and a half months, the kingdom of God teachings, his great manifesto being salt in light, not repaying evil with evil, but evil with good, uh, giving to the needy, not being judgmental, praying and fasting, all the while seeking first the kingdom of God. Those words. It says, whoever hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. Okay, you need to see this very clearly. Jesus says the only way to know for sure that your life is on the rock is not just that you know my teachings, but that you actually practice them. That's it. Like, like you got to see this. There is something about not just knowing the word of God, but actually doing the word of God, putting it into practice. There's something in that moment that anchors you into the very bedrock of Christ himself. It's the only way. Coming to church, it's good. Doesn't anchor you necessarily on the rock. Tithing to this church, by the way, very good, says the pastor. It doesn't necessarily anchor you onto the rock. Like, like, like taking notes in my sermons, good. Doesn't necessarily anchor you to the rock. Jesus presents this whole new way of living in the Sermon on the Mount. It's this great manifesto when he says, whoever hears these words and then actually puts them into practice, that's the phronomos. That's the wise man. That's the intelligent man. That's the smart man. That's the one who will actually last through the storm. Jesus' kingdom teachings need to be lived out. I, I've, I've said this before, but when it comes to reading scripture, we have to understand that we study not as scholars, but as soldiers. Both Scholars and soldiers study, but for wildly different reasons. Scholars study for the sake of information. Soldiers study for the sake of mission. When we read the very words of God, we, we don't come as scholars just to fill our head with more stuff. No, no, no. It's not about what God used to do. This is about what God wants to do through us here and now. The Sermon on the Mount must be lived out. That is how you know you're on the rock. It anchors you. So in the words of Jesus, don't be a moros. See, I put the S on the end. Don't be dumb. Don't, don't build your life on shifting sand we got to build it on the rock of Jesus Christ. And when we actually do what Jesus tells us to do, we're not just anchoring ourselves onto the rock, but we are also inviting his kingdom to come. Like every time, hear me, every time somebody gives to the needy, there is God's kingdom. Every time that we shine God's light, there is his kingdom. Every time that we choose love over hate, generosity over greed, or mercy over judgment, there is the kingdom of God. As we do what Jesus says, it doesn't just anchor us, but, oh man, it invites the very kingdom of God to come. Worship team, come on back up. We're going we're gonna to close this all off with the words, the very last words of chapter 7. Look at this, verse 28. It says that when Jesus had finished saying these things, so the sermon's done. He's laid it out. He's finished. He's walked off the stage. Well, there's no stage. He's, he's removed himself. It, watch this. When he finished saying these things, it says the crowds were amazed at his teachings. Because he taught as one who had authority and not as their teachers of the law. Now, this is really interesting. Just to help you understand some Hebrew history, um, the rabbinic teaching style of the day was that a rabbi would get up and he would teach building upon some other rabbi. 
they would, they would find, they would say, so Rabbi Judah uh, said this, and Rabbi Shamil said that, and they would literally go along, and they would, they would build off of their teachings, and they would use those other rabbis as supporting texts. That, that's the rabbinic style. But Jesus shows up, <laughs> and he doesn't do that once. He preaches an entire sermon, and not once does he go back to some other rabbi. Not once does he pull in another teacher and say, well, they said this, and I kind of see it this way. No, he just declarative, like he just makes like absolute statements. He'll say like, this I say to you, boom, and just lays it out. He, he, he doesn't need the support of other rabbis. Why? Because Jesus was not just another rabbi. He doesn't present himself as just another rabbi. He's not just another teacher. He's not just another wise sage. No, he is God incarnate. And there's not a moment that he comes and he presents himself as a rabbi just to be considered alongside other rabbis. No, he presents himself as God, declaring a whole new way to be human a whole new way to live your life. It's upside down from that of the world. It's backwards. He says, this is the way of the kingdom. And it says the crowds were amazed at his authority. Can I just ask the question today? Are you amazed at Jesus? Like when you listen to his teachings, to his whole new way to be human, does it inspire you? Does it guide you? Does, does your heart burn within you? Like are you, ast- does he astonish you? He should. Like he really, really should. I pray his words do because they are the words that anchor you onto the rock. I've preached a lot of sermons <laughs> and I try to point people to the truth. <laughs> Jesus just says, yeah, I am the truth. Listen to my words, F- do them, follow them. That is the phronomos life. That is the wise life. That is the life that stands through the storm. And I don't know who I'm talking to today. I don't know, I don't know what you're going through right now. I don't necessarily need to know, but my guess is that there are many people here right now that the storm has descended upon you. You had a moment like me in the Gander airport. Everything was fine, blue skies, life was good. And then all of a sudden that sliding door opened and you went, "Uh uh-oh. Storms come. Storms come. But friend, if we are rooting ourselves on the rock of Jesus Christ, I just need to tell you and encourage you today, you are not alone. Just because the storm is present does not mean that God is absent. Just because the clouds have rolled in doesn't mean that you're the only one in the equation. Just because the wind and the waves and the diagnosis and the loss and the hurt and the pain are here, it doesn't mean you're alone. God is with you. God is with you. Again, our narrative, our gospel is not some weird health, wealth, prosperity gospel. It's not receive Jesus and we get to fly over the storm. No. It's that he will be enough to get us through. He will be enough to get us through if we just anchor ourselves onto him. In the great promise today, can we stand on up to our feet? The great promise today is not just that Jesus goes through the storms with us, But I want you to hear this. The great promise is that he himself went through the ultimate storm for us. See, somewhere around three years after Jesus preached the Sermon on the Mount, he lived it out. 
the ultimate storm descended upon him at the cross of Calvary. The greatest wind and waves that have ever come for him came in the form of spikes being nailed into his hands and to his feet. And as he hung on the cross and the sins of humanity laid upon him, he became them. It was in that moment that his house was shaken to its core. But I thank God that through it all, he stood strong. (laughs) That through it all, he stood strong. And what he accomplished on the cross is not just a message of salvation and freedom. It's not just a message that he's gonna be with us uh, through our storms, but that he has gone ahead and made a way for us to be together forever. He went through the ultimate storm so that you and I don't have to. And I'm gonna praise him for that. I'm gonna worship him for that. I'm gonna exalt his name for that. That he took my place. He died my death. He is a good God who loves us so much. Listen, we're gonna sing a song as we close. Uh, It's called Firm Foundation. I just want you to listen to these words. It says, Christ is my firm foundation the rock on which I stand. When everything around me is shaken, anybody watch the news last night? Our world is shaken. Things are moving. We don't know what tomorrow or the next day or the next year is gonna bring, but I love this. When everything around me is shaken, I've never been more glad that I've put my faith in Jesus because he's never let me down. He's faithful through generations, so why would he fail now? He won't. Parkwood, he won't. He won't, he won't, he won't. If we anchor ourselves, if we plant ourselves, I promise you this, not that life is gonna be easy, but I promise you this, that he will get you through the storm. And so we run to him, we look to him, and we listen to him, but we also do what he says. We must put into practice what he says. And so right now, all across this room, just before we go, we're gonna sing this out, and I just want to encourage us from the front to the left, the top to the bottom, all around this room, use this even as an opportunity. Man, if this is a picture of your life right now, you're on sandy ground. The good news is it is never too late to rebuild. It is never too late to switch sides. It is never too late to say, Jesus, I need you. I'm done doing it the world's way. I'm done listening to the culture. I need your words and your plan and your God. Right now, we can anchor ourselves on the rock of Jesus Christ. So church, let's worship and let's run to the rock of Jesus. Let's sing.